Everybody feeling good? Did you bring a Bible with you? Oh, come on. Did you bring a Bible with you? All right. I, I just need to know, as per usual, who brought a real Bible? Just hold a, like a real Bible. Okay, good. All the spiritual people. Awesome. Hey, um, I want to just take a moment tonight before we jump into the Word as we get ready to conclude our series on the greatest commandment. And I want to introduce our speaker to you. And a lot of you, he needs no introduction. He's part of the team here, and he's been on our team for a number of years. As a matter of fact, uh, Pastor Sam was our high school pastor for a number of years. Uh, in the last few months, he's actually transitioned, and he now oversees all of our young adults. He oversees all the small groups here in the church. He has a huge role uh, when it comes to leadership here at the church. And tonight, we've asked him to conclude this series. And I want you to just lean in tonight. Sam's an incredible Bible teacher. And I promise you, if you lean in, God will speak to you tonight. So come on, from the outset, let's lean in. Let's get ready to hear from God. And Sam, come on, watch do you think about it. Thank you, Harrison. Awesome. I hope it's okay, because I'm teaching from an iPad. So what's that say about me? No. <laughs> awesome. How's everyone doing? Good? Good. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's my privilege to get to share this evening, and uh, thanks for tuning in if you're joining us via live stream. But would you guys go in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 10? That's where we're going to be uh, in this evening, Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking at a story that a lot of us are familiar with. How many of you guys are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan? Heard that one, right? But we're going to pray for fresh eyes this evening as we look at it. But we're going to be Diving in there, and we're in this series uh, on Wednesday evenings, we're closing it out tonight, uh, on the greatest commandment, which, you know, the greatest commandment that's revealed in the New Testament, revealed uh, through Jesus, is to love the Lord your God, essentially with everything, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says that it's all the law and the prophets, everything from the Old Testament, everything that God revealed, it, it hangs on these two things. And so they essentially are what you, know, you and me are supposed to be learning how to grasp and fulfill. And actually the Bible says that for you and for me as Christians, people that have put our faith in Christ, that God has given us a new heart. And it says that he's actually written the law upon our hearts. And so we have the ability actually to love God with everything. We have the ability to love our neighbors as ourselves. But this evening we're gonna dive into Luke chapter 10 and we're gonna see uh, what God wants to speak to us through uh, this you know, a story in the Bible that some of us are familiar with. So let's check it out. And it's in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. I'm reading it in the New King James Version of the Bible, because that's the version that Pastor Bayless uses, and that's the version that Jesus uses. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, speaking of Jesus, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, I love how Jesus doesn't give him an answer. Jesus goes, it's story time. <laughs> A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. And Jesus says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, 
he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So this guy, he's a, he's a lawyer, and for us to understand that, you know, it, it means that he's a scholar in the, the Torah, which was the first five books of the Old Testament, that this guy would have, his whole life would have been devoted to knowing these scriptures and knowing how to properly interpret them and apply them to his life. And he approaches Jesus with this question on how to inherit eternal life. And really, it was a deep theological question. He's trying to get Jesus to wrestle with him in a theological conversation. And really, with what he's asking is he wants to know, Jesus, how do you break down the Torah? How do you break down the Old Testament? What do you think are the most important laws that we need to obey in order for us to be a part of that eternal life that is to come? I love how Jesus goes, hey, what do you think? And he tells him what he thinks, and Jesus goes, hey, I say you're right, cool, let's move on. (laughs) But he wants to justify himself. What that means is that this guy thinks that he already knows the answer, but also that he's already fulfilling it as well. Have you guys realized that when we want to justify ourselves, it's because we don't want to change anything about the way we're thinking, and we don't want to change anything about the things that we're doing, right? And so he, he wants to justify himself to Jesus. And how many of you guys realize that if you want to keep on going how you're going, if you don't want to change how you're thinking, if you don't want to change how you're living, don't talk to Jesus, <laughs> right? Like, don't talk to Jesus, and especially about something like this, because Jesus engages him in this story, and he really reveals his heart, and I think there's some awesome things that we can learn as we study it, and then on the back half, we'll, we'll apply it to ourselves tonight. So would you guys pray with me as we dive in? Father, we thank you. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word, and God, we're praying for fresh eyes to see it. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're with us and that you teach us, that you would reveal more to us through the word, and you would speak to us individually as well as corporately, God. We thank you for it, and we thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, I want you to say amen. 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 Awesome. Hey, how many of you guys, when you were growing up, you heard your parents or your mom shouting things like this around your house, whose mess is this? Any of you guys remember that? You know, all of a sudden, you're just going about your business, and all of a sudden, your mom's just like, Excuse me, who's, whose mess is this? And I remember for me growing up with three sisters, you know, and, and living in a small house that oftentimes we would hear our mom shouting out through the house, hey, whose mess is this? She'd go through all our names. She'd be like, Jessica, Sandra, Andrea, Sam, whose mess is this? But it was the greatest feeling when you would roll up to the scene and look at what mom's talking about, and you're just like, That ain't my mess. (laughs) You know, that ain't my mess. Check it out, girls, huh? Like, that was the best feeling, right? When you could just say, hey, that ain't my mess, because if it ain't my mess, I don't have to take responsibility for it. Time has passed. Time flies by. I'm married now. That doesn't work anymore. (laughs) I can't come across a mess and be like, that ain't my mess. My wife is like, hey, you know, we're one flesh. Hello, that is your mess, you know? My mess is your mess. But before I got married, I actually spent some time living with a group of guys. You know, I lived in a, in a townhouse with four different guys. And how many of you guys realize that living in a townhouse with four different guys, things get really messy? <laughs> and, you know, so as I'm living in this house with these guys, we had a lot of fun times. But the truth is our place was constantly a mess. The, the kitchen was, uh, you know, and, like, the bathroom was always a mess, and there was just stuff everywhere, and and we would try to keep it tidy and stuff, but it just seemed like every week, it just, we we would always, you know, come to the end of the week and be like, dude, what happened? Like, this place is a disaster, and so finally it was like, guys, this is ridiculous. We need to do something about this, and so we finally decided to get responsible, and we hired a maid. (laughs) You know, and we, we started saying, like, all right, let's all pitch in, and We'll have her come, and she'll clean our place. And, and the thing was, she would come, she'd clean our place, but then when she would leave, somehow we would destroy the place again. And, and 
you know, finally got to the point to where even though certain things weren't my mess, I found myself taking responsibility for them and starting to clean them up because I just had to ask myself, like, is this the type of environment I want to live in? And not only that, is this the type of environment I want to bring someone else into? <laughs> you know, and because of asking myself those questions, I started looking at messes that weren't mine, but starting to take responsibility for them. You know, I didn't want to become indifferent to the mess. I didn't want to just work around the mess and become apathetic to it. I, I had to begin to do something about the mess because we all lived under the same roof and we were all affected by the mess. How many of you guys realize that for us, this world is a mess? How many of you guys realize that because of sin and because of the lack of genuine love, this world we find is, is, is a mess. And we come across people oftentimes that are in a mess. And the question is, you know, are, are we going to work around it? Are we going to become apathetic to it? Are we going to become indifferent? Or are we going to want to do something about it? And it's interesting because Jesus tells this parable, tells this story in Luke, this parable of the Good Samaritan. And he sets up this story where there's a certain man who comes into you know, a, a really bad situation. He comes into a messy situation. And there's two individuals that come to him, two people that we would think would get involved, and two people that come by. But as they come across this man, they say, that ain't my mess. I'm not going to get involved. It's interesting because, you know, as Jesus is, is teaching this parable, he's talking to a guy who would have known the ins and outs of, of the Torah. You know, he, he understood the Bible, and he was a lawyer. And how many of you guys know that lawyers like loopholes? <laughs> you know, and, and so he, he's telling him this story, and he sets it up, and he sets it up where these two guys that avoid the mess that this person is in they could be justified in avoiding the mess, that there are some possible loopholes that these guys could be using to justify getting around this messy situation. And Jesus knows that, and he sets it up that way. And so we have these two guys, and it says that the priest, by chance, comes across this certain man who's there, he's stripped, and he's unconscious, and he comes across him, but he passes by on the other side. He avoids him like some of us avoid Girl Scouts at the grocery store right now. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know, like, like he avoids him and passes by on the other side. And the question is, why? Because it seems like in the story at this point, like, hopes just got raised. It's like this guy fell on hard times. But here comes a priest. He represents God for the people. Here's one of his people, and he's down and out on his luck. Shouldn't he do something? But he, he passes by, and it's why. And there's a, a possible loophole, possible reason why. And, you know, for him as a priest, he had to keep himself in a place of being ceremonially clean, which means he needed to keep himself pure to be able to present the sacrifices and offer up the sacrifices on behalf of the people. And so for him, as he went about doing his job, he had to make sure that he was in a place where he was clean. And there were a few different ways that you could become unclean as a priest. But one of the quickest ways that you could become unclean as a priest was to actually have anything to do with a dead body, to, to touch a corpse. And as he comes across this guy, I mean, he looks like he might be dead, and I don't know if I should check it out or not. But if he was to get involved with this man, and if he was dead, then he could potentially become unclean and not be able to perform his duties. But the thing is, it says that he was traveling down this road from Jericho, meaning that he was actually leaving just serving at the temple. So this wasn't really going to hinder him from being able to offer up sacrifices. He wasn't on his way to the temple to do it. He was just finishing up doing that. You know, but for him, as he passes by, he realizes if I get involved, this guy turns out to be dead, then actually I have to go through a week-long process, according to the Bible. I have to go through a week-long process to get clean again. 
And so for him, he would have had to return back to the temple and he would have had to go through a whole week of doing ceremonial washings and then he would have to go and hang out with all the other unclean people. It would have been kind of humiliating and it was going to cost him something. It was going to be something that was really, really inconvenient for him if he got involved in this and it turned out to be that way. Not only that, as he's leaving the temple, he would have been not leaving empty-handed. He would have been paid for what he was doing. They got paid a tenth off of the tithes that were brought to the temple. So he would have been coming down this road, and he would have been carrying groceries with him. He would have had some money on him. And so him getting involved in this person's mess could have also cost him those things. It was going to potentially affect his work. It was going to potentially cost him something. It just was a big inconvenience. And the Levite comes by, and he sees, hey, the priest just went around him. He does the same, and they both pass by. And they don't help this person that they see in trouble. And the reality is this, is that they saw the person there in the midst of his need, but the reality is that they saw how inconvenient it was going to be to get involved as well. When it comes to us loving our neighbors, it's not always going to be convenient. How many of you guys realize that it's, it's going to be inconvenient sometimes for us to get involved in other people's messes? And these people, though they saw him, they really saw the inconvenience of it. This wasn't a good idea because it's going to cost me something, but also it's not really the safest thing for me to do in this situation. And they just realized that this was too much of an inconvenience, so they pass him by. And so Jesus says, hey, well, there's another guy who comes down the road. And he says, a certain Samaritan comes down the road. And this kind of loses its punch in our day and age. Because when Jesus brings up the Samaritan, the blood in the lawyer that he's telling the story to would have begun to to boil. You see, because Jews, they did not like Samaritans. They actually despised Samaritans. There was just age-long tension between these people. In our day, it might be like Jesus saying that, you know what, Donald Trump got mugged and left for dead and a certain New York Times journalist (laughs) came down the road. Like, these people were enemies. They didn't like each other. It was the fact that, you know, to the Jews, they they looked at the Samaritans and they they were not pure bread. They were were half-breeds. They were a part of the, the kingdom of Israel, but in their history, there was a period where, you know, the Assyrians took over that part of the kingdom, the northern part of the kingdom, and, and Samaria was inhabited by pagan people, by Babylonians, and, and the people of Israel that were there, they intermarried, and they got involved in all kinds of idolatry, and they even took on their own forms of worship to God that were mixed with, with idolatry and things, and so they just, uh, they, they despised each other. And for someone whose life is devoted to getting the Torah right and worshiping God right, this guy represented everything that he despised. But in Jesus' story, the hero is wearing black. And Jesus says a certain Samaritan came, and, and this is the one who actually got involved. This is the one who actually went to the man intended to him. And Jesus says, which one of these three proved to be neighbor to the man. And the lawyer can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He says, the one who showed mercy. He avoids saying it altogether. And this was a guy who from the outset thought that he knew it and he thought that he was living it. But Jesus revealed to him through this story that, hey, if loving your neighbor extends to everyone, even your enemies, even if loving your neighbor means crossing that line and showing love to your enemy, 
How are you doing now? How are you doing in justifying yourself to this now? See, because Jesus taught in Matthew 5 that for us, when it comes to loving our neighbors, it includes loving our enemies. For the people of Jesus' day, for them, the way that they read it, and Jesus refers to it in Matthew 5, the way that they read it was, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. Sounds good, right? But Jesus, as he comes on the scene and as he's revealing the heart of God, Jesus changes things up a bit. And this is what this man needed to get. And this is what we need to get. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 43, he says this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. For he who makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Tax collectors were another despised people at the time and right now in tax season, some of you guys probably feel the way, that way. <laughs> to any of our tax people out there, we love you. Anyway, um, and if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Jesus is obviously talking about us growing in perfecting love. That for us, really our pursuit is to let God's love begin to just overwhelm us and perfect in us that we find our hearts bursting for people. That we find ourselves loving people more and more and loving even our enemies. And one question in the message tonight is, is this. If Jesus was to tell this story to you and to me, who would he use in the story? If Jesus was to tell this story to us, who would he use? Who would it be that Jesus would say, this is the person that I'm asking you to love? Because for us, when it comes to loving our neighbors, it means even them too. But Jesus shares this with us, not just to teach us, you know, who loving our neighbors extends to. This man came to him and he was asking for boundaries on who I need to be responsible to love. And Jesus was interested in taking the boundaries off. And Jesus isn't interested in just telling you and me, you know, who it extends to. But he also wants us to begin to act upon our love for our neighbors and for our people. The thing that I've been meditating on within this verse that's been really standing out to me is the fact that Jesus ends it by saying, go and do likewise. You know, that Jesus is calling us to, to act upon loving our neighbors. He says, go and do likewise. And real quick, as we are even moving towards the close of the message, what I wanna do is I just wanna share with us a few practical things when it comes to us loving our neighbor that we can gather from this parable of the Good Samaritan. And we see three different things that I want to touch on tonight from what the Good Samaritan actually did. When we look at Luke 10, 33 through 34, it says this, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, the man that was in trouble. And it says, when he saw him, he had compassion, so he went to him. What I want to look at real quick with the rest of the time that I have is that he saw, that he felt, and that he acted. And I feel like when it comes to us loving our neighbors, these are three key things for us. The first is this, that, that he saw. Do you guys realize that today, it, it, it would be a miracle if we could just get people to look each other in the eye again, right? Just for us to, to acknowledge each other's presence. I sometimes will jog in the wetlands in Bolsa Chica, not far from where we live, and, and I'll be jogging, and it's amazing how many people will pass by, and we won't even, like, look at each other. Like, I'll, I'll be trying to get their attention, but they won't really look at me. It's like I have to jog next to them and, like, look up at them, like, hey, I'm here. Like, I'm with you. You know, we're on this road running together, and people, we, we 
hardly even look at each other. We're more engaged oftentimes with our devices than we're engaged with people around us, right? And it's one thing for us to, to see people more around us and realize that people are, are present around us, but I feel like God really wants to help us to actually see people in our days. You know, the, the Bible in, in Proverbs, it, there's this interesting proverb that has always stood out to me. And it says this in Proverbs 20, 12. It says, ears to hear and eyes to see, both are gifts from the Lord. Ears to hear and eyes to see. And, and I feel like with this proverb, what it's telling you and me is not just that God's responsible for creating our eyes and creating our ears, but also I believe that God wants to give you and me, how many of you know, ears to hear, that he wants us to be able to be people who hear his voice. But I believe God also wants to give us eyes to see, that he wants us to be people who have eyes to see what he's up to. And oftentimes what he's up to is wanting to get us involved in loving someone else. And God wants to give us eyes to see this. But I believe it takes intentionality for us to be able to step into this. Because oftentimes as I go about my days, probably a lot like you, I'm more consumed with the things I have to do in my day that I fly by people all the time and I hardly even see them. But you know, God has been kind of slowing me down lately. And, and recently, even with meditating on these verses, I just took a couple of the verses from this parable and I put them on my phone and stuff and I was just sitting with them and meditating on them. And, and I've been asking God, you know, God, give me eyes to see things. Give me ears to hear what you want to do. Help me to see people in my day. And sure enough, the other day, I had an appointment to go meet with a friend. We were going to go grab some coffee and talk over some things we were working on together. And so I'm getting ready to go to this appointment. And sometimes I happen to be late to appointments. And so I was like, I'm going to make sure that I'm ready in time and I'm not going to be late this time. And so I leave my house and I'm giving myself enough time to get there. And I begin to drive, and, and the light's about to turn yellow to red, and so I speed to make sure I get through it, you know, and, and, I, and I made it, and I, and I sped through it and stuff, and, I, and I'm flying through it. But then all of a sudden, out of my peripheral, out of the side of my eye, I just, I see this person pulled over on the side of the road, and I just keep driving down. But all of a sudden, the words from this verse that we've been reading this evening just pop up in front of me, go and do likewise. And I'm like, right now, like for real, you know, like, and it pops up and, and, and all I saw was this person on the side and they were down by their wheel and I'm just like, but I'm doing good on time and I'm about to go meet up and I, I don't want to be late and I'm just like, oh Jesus, you always do this. <laughs> Loving your neighbor is never convenient. It's hardly ever convenient or comfortable, but you know, I, I find myself turning around and, and going back and I head over there and the person's down the road just a little bit further, but they're still pulled over. And so I pull over next to him and I'm trying to walk up and not be creepy, you know? And I'm just like, are, are, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And, and there's a girl and she's just showing me how her wheel, she lost, you know, one of the, the bolts on her wheel. And so her wheel was coming loose and she had to pull over. And, and so she's trying to tighten it with the remaining bolts that she has. And so I'm like, all right, cool. Um, I'm not really that good with tools, you know, and, but I, I tried to help her the best I could and we got it tight and then she started to drive and I was like, I'm just going to follow behind you with my flashers on and there's a gas station down at the bottom, we'll get there, you know, and so I, I, I start to go down the road with her and her wheel starts doing this again and so she pulls over and we make sure that we tighten it again and stuff and then we, we go down and I just felt the Lord tell me, you know, as she pulls into this gas station, just follow her in there. And so I did, and I pulled up next to her, and I had some money in my pocket, and, and I went up to her, and I was like, hey, are you good now? Do you think everything's all okay? And she's like, yeah, I'll be good from here. And I was like, all right. I was like, well, hey, this is all I got on me. Like, hopefully it helps your cause and stuff, but I just feel like, you know, I would love to pray for you. Uh, is there any way that I could pray for you right now? And she was like, yeah, actually, you could just pray for my life. And I could start to see, you know, noticing her car and stuff that it looked like she'd probably been living out of her car. And, and I'm like, all right, well, hey, I just want you to know that, you know, when I was 21, Jesus got involved in my life and, and, and his grace and his love has changed me and it's the best thing that could possibly happen 
to you. And I just want to pray that over you and just pray for God to begin to cause people's kindness to open up to you. And, and just, I want to bless you right now. She's like, yeah, that sounds great. So we prayed, and in this moment, I just sensed God's presence so strong as we just prayed there together. And we got done, and she's like, hey, I'm gonna pay this forward. And I'm like, do that if you want. You know, but I walked away from that moment, and I just realized, in that simple moment, it's kind of what God wants us to be doing. There's stuff like that, I think, like, cool, like, you walk away from moments like that, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm a real Christian. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and I feel like this is the type of stuff that God wants us to be engaging with, and he wants to give us eyes to see it. And it's not convenient, and sometimes it's, unco it's uncomfortable to ask people if you could pray for them sometimes and stuff. I get it. But the truth is, when you step out and do it, Man, God does something so amazing to our hearts. But he does something so amazing for those people we never even know. We get to be a part of God's love tracking people down. God's love is just after people, and we get to be a part of it. He wants us to be a part of cleaning up the mess. And so we, we need to ask him for eyes to see. The next thing is... is it says that, that he felt, you know, that, that he had compassion for this man. And compassion's an interesting thing. You know, it's, it's that deep sense of just pity that we feel on people where we just, we want to do something to help their situation that we see them in. And the, the word compassion that, that we get in English that comes from the Latin word, you know, it, it, it's a combination of two words, which means together suffer. You know, it, it's us wanting to get involved in some of the suffering that we see with people, we just, we feel for them. I think about my wife who always goes to this certain coffee shop in Huntington Beach. And, and she's over there all the time to where she's gotten to know all the baristas there. Like, they are worried if they don't see her. You know, and, and so she was going there this one morning, and she sees one of the girls that she always sees there come out of a car where she was in with her boyfriend. And she comes out, and she's, she's crying. She's you know, bawling really hard, and, and my wife sees her, and immediately she's just, like, gripped with this compassion for her. You know, she herself has felt things like this girl might be feeling. She's experienced things, you know, heartache and stuff in, in relationships and tough times like that, and, and it just got to her. So she just stopped, and in her car before she went into the coffee shop, she decided to write a note to this girl of all the things that she wished someone had told her when she was in those places in her life. So she just wrote her about the love of God. She wrote her about that girl's worth and how valuable she is. And she just wrote her this note. And then when she went into the coffee shop, she was there, had cleaned herself up a little bit. And she goes, hey, this is for you. you know, and have a good day and, and I'll see you next time. And sure enough, the next time that Nicole went in there, this girl was just beaming, and she, she came out, and she, like, hugged her, and she was like, dude, thank you so much. And now every time this girl sees her, she's just, like, bursting, like, always smiling so big when she sees Nicole. And all because Nicole just acted on that sense of compassion that she felt, seeing her suffer. She's going through something, but Nicole's like, you know what? I want to join you in that, and I want to help you in the midst of that. I think about how, for me, Probably one of the most inconvenient and difficult things that I found myself getting involved in as God's been working on this stuff in my own life was going to a motel outreach with uh, one of the pastors here at the church who I served alongside with in youth, uh, Pastor Gabe Rodriguez, and we went to this motel outreach, and there were so many amazing people that we were able to bless there. But there was this one particular kid that stood out to me. And for some reason, my heart just bursted with compassion for this kid. And as I got to talk to him, I just felt like this kid has to come to the summer camp we're about to have. And I just want to make, I just feel like I want to make sure that this kid is taken care of. I see what he's growing up in. I, I just see, you know, all the stuff he's surrounded by. I just want to make sure that this guy's okay. I just felt gripped by something to get involved in this kid's life. 
And so we talked to him, talked to his mom. We got him to go to this camp. He had this amazing God encounter up there, came down. But for the next year, I found myself just completely involved in this kid's life. And let me tell you, it was the most messy season. It was very inconvenient. It was costly. It was full of extreme ups where I was like, God, you're amazing and you're doing awesome things. And, and there was so many times where I was like, God, where are you? But getting involved in this kid's life and getting involved in his mom's life and helping them get out of homelessness and, and into independence, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever been a part of in my life so far. And it changed my heart so much just to act on the compassion that God gripped me with in that moment. And for us, God wants us to be people who have compassion for people that we come across. It says that the Samaritan had compassion. And the truth is that you and I can only give what, what we have. And this is a heart thing. And I feel like Jesus, he has nothing but compassion to pour into our hearts. The Bible says that everything that, that Jesus did as he looked on people, as he looked on the crowds, it says he had compassion for them. And it moved him to act. And I feel like as the people of God, as Cottonwood Church, we need to be asking God, God, give us hearts of compassion. We're not gonna be able to solve all the world's problems, but the reality is that God wants us to get involved with some people that we come across in our days. That there's some people that God's gonna put things on our hearts to get involved in. And I wish I could tell you that it won't be messy, but the truth is it'll be the greatest blessing to your life and to theirs to step into it and to love your neighbor as yourself. The last thing, and I'm gonna close with this, is it says that, that he acted, you know, he, he went to this person. You know, and, and it's interesting how when it talks about the priest, it says that by chance this priest came across this man. And in the original language, that, that word is a, is a combination of two words. It means that with, and then it means the Lord. So really it's saying that by divine providence, this guy came across, but he went around. <laughs> And the reality is that God is gonna put us in those moments where by chance, we happen to run into that person. You know what I'm talking about? You ever had that moment where you're just like, you know that you're set up by God, but you're like, ah. <laughs> and there's so many by chance moments that I wish I would step into. But God will set it up sometimes for us to get involved with people. And I think about how when, when I went to go vote back in you know, November, not telling you who I voted for, but when I went to go vote, I ran into this man in line and, and we got to talking. He actually like hit me with a deep theological question because we had been talking about church and he's like, hey, so you know, how is Jesus and the Father different but yet the same? You know, I was like, dude, I just woke up, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> but we got to talking and he told me a little bit about, you know, what's going on in his life and he's an older gentleman, he's in his 80s and and he has some health issues and stuff. And, and I talked to him and he, he doesn't really have anybody around still in his life. And, and, and my heart just went out to this guy as we were, talk, as we were talking and that day. And, and the, the day passed and I, I went through that week. But there was this time where I was just sitting down at lunch. And all of a sudden, that man just came back to mind. And I just felt like God told me, don't forget about him. And I was like, all right. And I knew the area where the guy lived because he lived in an area that I used to live in. And so I, it was like he lived in right near the townhouses I used to live by. And that's all I really knew. But I felt like God told me just, don't forget about him. So I told my wife, this is really weird, but I feel like God told me not to forget about this guy. And it's coming around Christmas time. And I just feel like I'm supposed to get a card for this guy. And I'm just gonna ride it in faith. And I'm just gonna go find him. And so this one day, this one Saturday, me and my, my wife have this card. And we ride in it to this guy. And we just went out on a hunt for him. And we drove over to the area where he said that he lived. 
I didn't know an address, I didn't know a street, and all I had was a first name. And we saw a few people, and I was like, hey, do you know this guy? And they were like, nope. <laughs> I asked another person, and they're like, nope, never heard of him. And so we're driving around, and all of a sudden I just felt like, hey, just turn right. And I turned right, followed it around. The street was called like King's Way or something like that. I was like, Jesus. You know, and so <laughs> I turned right, and I followed around, and all of a sudden, I, I see this car pulling into a parking spot, and I stop. And I see it's an older gentleman getting out, and we just stopped and waited to see. And I was like, can't be, no chance. And he gets out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there he is. And my wife's like, nah, -uh, like you're joking. And I, no, that, that's him. And I get out, and I go up to him, and, and at first I startled him, <laughs> you know, because I was all like freaking out. But I'm like, hey, do you remember me? Like, and, and he's like, oh, Oh, yeah, the nice guy, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we chatted for a bit, and I was like, hey, like, you know, we, we got this for you. It's just a card, and uh, just wanted to come and, and find you. I just really felt like, you know, we'd love to come visit you sometime and, and chat more and stuff, and he was like, oh, yeah, that'd be fine. Today's not good, but you can come back another time, and, and so we're like, cool, perfect, and we went back and visited him about a week later, and we go in there, and the only Christmas card that he had was the one that we gave him. And we sat there with him, and this guy smokes like four packs a day, and so he's just in there like smoking and all this stuff, and we're just like, okay, yeah, loving your neighbor can be uncomfortable, you know? <laughs> and we're sitting there, and, and, but he just was, you know, entertaining us, and, and we were chatting with him, and this and that, and he told us right away, you know, hey, don't try to convert me, you know, and stuff, and we're like, hey, man, we just want to love on you, and we just began this relationship with this older gentleman that we visit now from time to time, and it's something that God has led us into, and it's a mess that God has got us involved in because he wants to love on this gentleman through us. You know, and really, as we go about our days, I feel like there's plenty of opportunities for us to, to love our neighbors. And really, I think we just need to be people who are asking God for eyes to see, asking him for hearts to feel. But then being people who are just wanting to obey God to just step out and do it. Let me tell you, the more that we do this, the more that it just changes us in the best way.